I'm going to read the scripture for today one more time. And this is in the, the tradition of Lexio. Uh, we read, when we read a, the scripture, we read it n- numerous times, um, listening for God's direction and wisdom. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. There is so much that is the same as that first Easter. Followers of Jesus are dispersed, aren't we? huddled, almost as if in hiding, fearful of what might happen. Only a few venture out to take care of essential tasks, essential work, like tending the body. There's so much that is the same as that first Easter. There's so much that is not the same for us because life has forever changed in our lifetime. The threat of pandemic is no longer a threat. We're living in it and we're living through it. And given the degradation of ecosystems at the hands of humanity, resulting in the deterioration of biosystems that normally kind of protect life, we are being told by microbiologists and climate scientists and environmental scientists, epidemiologists, Human resilience is in question. Always has been, I think. It is decidedly not the same. Not the same calls for change. Not the same invites us to do more than, oh, consider transformation. (laughs) Frankly, we're in it now. We are in it now. And how we live in it determines how we will get through it and who we will become on the other side. Now we could get through it with increased bitterness and cynicism, that's an option, and certainly some are doing that. We could get through it with increased fatalism, like the left behind apocalyptic crowd who is doing more fear mongering, and certainly people are doing that. It's a decidedly not Christian view of the world because it has no hope in it. Or, and I believe this is the Christian option, one we share with other spiritual traditions, so I think it's got some play. We could live through this time with generosity and hope. We could cultivate that, right? Generosity and hope. The first followers, for the most part, for the most part, chose generosity and hope. But first they had to deal with their fear. Fear is a powerful emotion. It can paralyze us and it can provoke us to take action. Sometimes that action is generative and sometimes it's not. It operates from a place in our brain that is all about survival. It's there for a reason. It's there so we survive, not as an individual, but as humanity, right? As community, as a species. Fear is so powerful that spiritual traditions across the millennia have addressed it as a thing that needs attention, that needs some controlling, some containing, some taming. Some wisdom comes out of our spiritual traditions about how to 
manage fear. Unfortunately, the flip side of that has been people suppress it. And it's like when you push down a, a buoy under the water, eventually it's going to pop back up. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome fled from the tomb for terror and amazement seized them. Have you ever been gripped by fear and admitted to it? If we're honest, all of us, to some extent, have been seized by terror and amazement at what is happening in our lifetime. Fear can be a contagion that wrecks more havoc, and fear can also be an able teacher. Those three women didn't say anything to anyone because they were afraid. Have you done that? I've done that. Didn't speak up, afraid of being put down again, afraid of being misunderstood again, afraid of being told, I don't know what I'm talking about again. They took a risk. They took a risk and spoke up. How did they get from they didn't tell anybody to they told somebody? That's a journey. They likely found courage in each other, in the solidarity of their little community, the strength to tell what they saw and what they experienced together. We need community. It is essential for human survival. We need people beyond our little circle of kinship ties. We need community. You know, I love my immediate family. They're my strength. But sometimes we, we idolize this family unit, unit to the exclusion of community. We need intentional communities of belonging, groups of people like faith communities, willing to be accountable to one another and to and for the common good. It's time to wake up and see it's not the same. Things have to change. We have to change. Our ministry is to call for this change, to call people to change. It's not the same. Let's imagine how to build, how to rebuild community. Let's imagine how to rebuild a community in which everyone has access to health care. Because frankly, that's a matter of public health. It's hubris to think that, well, I've got mine, I've got my doctor, I've got my health insurance, I'm good to go. Because it doesn't matter if you have yours and I have mine. When there is a microbe traveling through populations that have no access, that have little or no resource, it's not the same. Both my grandmothers lived through the pandemic of 1918 to 1920. You heard that, right? 18 to 20. It's almost two years long. One lived in such a remote area, my father says it didn't impact the community. My maternal grandmother would have been about 12 or 13, lived in rural southern Indiana, and it did come there to Norman, Indiana. And for some reason, I remember her talking about that. I don't remember how it came up in conversation, but I do remember marveling at the fact that everyone around her seemed to be sick. Grandma, didn't you get sick? No, I didn't get sick. Well, what did you do, Grandma? Oh, I took care of the sick people. She would have been about 12 or 13 years old. And now I know that traumatic experiences affect the developing brains of children and, and adolescents. And I wonder to this day you know, how that affected her brain and who she ended up becoming. I literally thought when we were having that conversation, well, that won't happen in my lifetime because we have modern medicine. <laughs> That's hubris. That's hubris. Hubris is excessive self-confidence, and there's a lot of that going around these days. There's a lot of hubris spewing out from so-called Christian churches and the most egregious claim, I've gone from preaching to meddling, I know, is that we are getting into heaven and nobody else is. That's the most egregious claim. Western hu Christianity's hubris has much to account for in the way we have lived out this idolatrous claim. We've got ours. We're saved. We're safe. Mm -mm. 
we could learn something from our Orthodox brothers and sisters in Christ who understand the Easter event is a salvation event for all of humanity and all of creation. In the Eastern Church, Jesus destroys hell, tramples it, destroys it. We could also learn something from the ancient Celtic Christians that look for the light in everyone and everything. After hearing a talk on Celtic Christian spirituality, a Mohawk elder who had been invited to comment on the common ground between Celtic Christian spirituality and the native spirituality of his people, he stood before this gathered body of people with tears in his eyes. And he said this, as I have listened to these themes, you know, like the one about looking for light in everyone and everything, as I have listened to these themes, I've been wondering where I would be today. I've been wondering where my people would be today. And I have been wondering where we would be as a Western world today. If the mission that came to us from Europe centuries ago had come expecting to find light in us, that would rewrite history, wouldn't it? We could write the future looking for the light, right? How could that change the future script. The three women at the tomb eventually remembered the light that they had learned and found in Christ, and they let it be reignited in themselves, and they understood it's not the same. It's not the same. This group of women, they were the first to proclaim the good news. Later, they will be denied and silenced in the medieval church to proclaim it further, but boy, we've got that memory. These women worked through their fear. They leaned into it. They learned from it, and that is hard, hard work. It's important work, and it's work that's done in the company of trusted others. I imagine there was a lot of conversation among them, some silence, a little more fear, words of encouragement, what if, wrestling over what to do next, what is the next right thing? Generosity and hope, looking for and creating generosity and hope, these are the next right things to do, for this is how we will let the light in. And then we will be able to see that light in others and in all of creation. We are not defined by what we let go. We are defined by what we let in. It's not the same. We are being called to reimagine a future built with generosity and hope so the light can come in, can get in, in through us, in through the cracks, into the world. That is the Easter message. That's the call of Easter. Let's let the light in. Let's write the future with the light in it and answer the call of Easter. Christ is risen. The light cannot and will not be extinguished. Amen.